It was April 2024 when I had the bright idea to challenge myself to beat Path of Exile in 24 hours of playtime and get all four Void Stones. But to make it more interesting, I did it on a free-to-play account. I suffered so you don't have to. First off, hi, I'm Daniel. Before jumping into this madness, what does free-to-play really mean in the context of Path of Exile? Well, you can download the game and play it as much as you want for free. The account can quickly be made or you just link your Steam to their website. Second, everything in the game can be earned and grinded for. On top of that, every boss in the game can be discovered and defeated so you don't have to buy a dozen DLCs to get access to all the bosses. There are no restrictions until you run out of space in your stash, which is that big box over there. This is where you can store all your stuff. And boy, is there a lot of stuff in Path of Exile. Every new account starts with four stash tabs. You can buy more tabs with real money to hold more items, but you can also buy premium stash tabs. Wow, fancy. <laughs> Premium tabs can be set public. This allows players to find it through the trade website. You can find cool items and sell it to other players to get currency. I love trade because of exactly that. The currency can then be used to buy better items and make numbers go higher, like in any ARPG. But I made a brand new account for this challenge and I only had four basic stash tabs and can't sell my items directly. Ish. There is a painful way to sell items, but you'll see. One thing I want to clarify is that in quotes beating Path of Exile isn't really a thing. It technically never ends, but you can set yourself a goal and achieve it. The goal I set for myself was to get all four Void Stones on a free-to-play account, which is, I think, a reasonable goal to have when you want to see how the endgame in Path of Exile works. I will explain more about the Void Stones when we finally get there. Not to spoil it too much right now, but this was an interesting journey that made me realize how amazing Path of Exile truly is for a free-to-play game. But this journey also showed the downsides of a true free-to-play player in the current version and in-game economy. If you are one of those players, I feel your pain now. <laughs> I truly do. With all of this out of the way, we can finally jump in, right? Well, first off, I don't suck at Path of Exile, but <laughs> I needed some help and also wanted to play a build that I always wanted to try out during a fresh start. This is Crouching Tuna's Lightning Arrow League Start Build Guide. The most meta build you can imagine, but there is a good reason why it's meta and people play it often. It just works in most cases and I also love bow characters. So it's the best of both worlds for this challenge. There was one thing that I was worried about which was the bossing capability. The Void Stones I mentioned earlier come from bosses like pretty dangerous ones. And bossing has a low rating in this guide. But I used one of the skills called Artillery Ballista before and it was actually quite solid. So I took the risk and this was the build that I followed all the way through. Next up was getting Path of Building set up on my second monitor. A third-party software that allows me to see where I need to path on the ginormous skill tree. Obviously not necessary, but this is just very handy for new players or people like me that are bad at the video game. The last thing is an item filter. You probably don't want to filter out items early on in the game, but the filter can also make rare items pop a bit more. It makes them very noticeable. So I grabbed a basic regular filter from filterblade.xyz, a project by Neversync. Now, with everything ready and having made a new account, I jumped into Path of Exile at 6 p.m. Starting off on the beach, barely alive, I crawled to my feet like every Monday morning. With a bow in my hands, I killed a dude and equipped the Burning Arrow skill gem into my bow. Walking along the beach in Twilight Strand, I stood before Hillock. 
To get into the first town, I had to get rid of him, which was fairly easy being a range character. In town, I had a few things to check out. First off, I set up my stash tab affinities, which automatically sorts many items into a tab that I choose. It doesn't take the items from my inventory, like in many other games, but it does help with sorting things out. After that, I quickly checked the NPC, which can sometimes sell boots with movement speed. I obviously wanted to be faster for this 24 hour challenge, so checking them once in a while is worth the few seconds. I also switched out the burning arrow skill with galvanic arrow, which shoots like a shotgun and does decent lightning damage early on. Out of Lion Eye's watch, I went through the first area and found the current NPC for the 3.24 Necropolis League. A few things before we move on. I did not use anything related to the league itself, meaning I did not use the graveyard to craft, nor did I use any of the embers or flames that can make monsters drop interesting items. The reason for that was I wanted to have a mostly clean playthrough of Path of Exile, but also wanted a fresh economy, which I can use to my advantage. Technically, this league isn't avoidable because every area is modified in some way and sometimes can drop more loot, like a lot more chaos orbs, but that was fairly rare. Just wanted to clarify that here. Now that I was ignoring the league mechanic, I went to the Tile Island to beat Hailrake. After easily shotgunning him down, I got my Quicksilver Flask as a quest reward so I can zoom through the acts a bit faster. Going into Mudflats, I got destroyed by... Roas. <sighs> Fuck me. I quickly moved on to the cave and shot my way through. God, I hate being chilled and frozen in this area. It's rough. Running past skeletons in the ledge and in the climb, I slightly underestimated the enemies. There has to be at least one death in the story, even if you have a few thousand hours. Having entered the prison, I used the waypoint, teleported back to town to check my gear, skill gems and rewards from NPCs. Mirage Archer was an obvious choice when it comes to a support skill gem for my bow character. It gave me a ghost above my head if I hit an enemy that then used my skill for a brief moment. This made it feel so much better running through areas. I also quickly did a side quest, getting an essence so I can craft a better bow later and got an additional skill point. As you may have seen in the fight right now, I was using a new skill called Shrapnel Ballista. It's a type of turret that I can quickly place and it shoots in a small cone in front of it. It helps a lot with single target enemies like tanky rares or bosses. Deeper in the lower prison, I fought Brutus and he was surprisingly easy for a leak start, which I love to see. Pushing deeper into Act 1, I equipped Sniper's Mark for additional single target damage on rare and unique enemies. The next big stop was the Cavern of Wrath. This is a monster level 12 area and unlocks more skill gems at the vendors in town. I got myself Reign of Arrows, which was my main skill throughout the story. It was insanely strong, which I totally didn't think it would. I checked my gear and got myself some cold resistance for the upcoming fight against Mervale, the Act 1 boss. I could make it seem like the fight against Mervale was dangerous and difficult, but to be honest, Mervale's first and second form was really easy. She went down quickly without much struggle. Entering Act 2, I breathe in the forest air and hear the blood-curdling screams of very angry monkeys. Mmm, beautiful nature. I picked up my feet and very quickly ran to the forest encampment. The major quests in Act 2 are the bandits, the weaver rescuing Helena and ultimately getting to the final Act 2 boss. I went through the old fields, then over the bridge and beat Creighton, one of the bandits. Then through the riverways onto the western forest. Everything was going well so far because damage was fine and defense well, as long as I don't get hit, everything is okay, right? I used the thematic seal and opened the connection to Act 1, which was closed by Piety. It's also a side quest from Act 1 that gave me a skill point later. 
I sometimes forget that one, which is really silly. In the meantime, I focused on finding the Weaver's Chambers and getting some power through the precise technique Keystone. In short, it gives me more damage if my accuracy is higher than my maximum life. It's an easy boost in damage, which I will need to fight the Weaver. Bruh. Okay, the first death doesn't count. Being a bit more careful and actually moving my ass, the Weaver didn't pose a big challenge. Now with the quest item Maligaro's Spike in my inventory, I went back to town, equipped a slightly better quiver and moved on to the Chamber of Sins. The biggest danger here was the server and ping. Dear Lord. By the way, shout out to Shitstain Steve. I love the server messages. <laughs> on to rescuing Helena from Fidelitas. I literally bit my tongue saying this. Overall, another easy boss fight thanks to the Reign of Arrows skill. I grabbed the Baleful Gem quest item, teleported back to town and checked the guide to see what skill gems are recommended for my level. First off, Blood Rage, which after killing an enemy has a chance to give me a Frenzy Charge. Each active Frenzy Charge gives me a bit more attack speed and slightly more damage. Second, the Herald of Thunder Aura, which gives flat lightning damage to all my attacks. In short, just more damage and speed, which I prefer. The thing is, an attack-based skill gets a lot of damage from the weapon, which was starting to feel kind of weak. I noticed this when fighting Oak, another bandit in the wetlands. It was fine, but far from fast. With two bandits gone, I went to Alira, the third and last bandit. Surprise, I didn't kill her, but actually helped her out. Helping her out gave me some mana regen, but most importantly, elemental resistance, which is very helpful early on. I also got the Apex, which I'll use in a second. Back to the wetlands, I poisoned the tree with Maligaro Spike, which blocks the entrance to the Val Ruins. Fighting my way through this hellhole of a place, I hate this layout so much, I finally found the right path and used the Apex on the Ancient Seal, thus bad fog or something came out. I don't know. Skipping ahead past the northern forest and the caverns, I entered the ancient pyramid. Going up the stairs one step at a time, I finally entered the Act 2 boss arena to fight the Val Oversoul. Not a terribly difficult fight, if you aren't getting hit by the big ass rocks from the ceiling. At this point my weapon was definitely lacking and I really wished for something better. With the Val Oversoul defeated, it was time to enter the city of Sarn, which is Act 3. On the way to the Sarn encampment, I found Clarissa. Helping her by defeating the bad guys starts the very long questline in this act. In short, I needed to help her find her boyfriend or lover, Tolman. Piety and her goons kidnapped him, but he was already dead. Enough of this! Showing Clarissa his bracelet, she gave me the key to the sewers. Skipping ahead through the sewers and doing a side quest, I also went through the marketplace, then through the battlefront, grabbing a quest item and quickly finding another quest item hidden in the docks. Some of you may realize how much I'm skipping here, but nothing exciting really happened and my damage was fine against basic mobs. Speaking of damage, I still really wanted a better bow. <laughs> Please, video game, drop me one. Moving through the Solaris Temple, I found Lady Diala, which just stood there and chilled, I guess. Anyhow, we swapped quest items. That's the official lore. Let's just pretend it is. Now with the quest item from Lady Diala, I burned the strange wall in the sewers and moved on to the Ebony Barracks. This is where I found General Gravicious. He is a dick. <laughs> I usually die once if I'm not overpowered at this point. Still, one death later, he goes down, which finished that side quest. This unlocks the Artillery Ballista skill gem. It's that stupidly strong skill that I showed at the start, and for some reason I didn't grab it. Well, I didn't grab it yet, 
because I just forgot to look at the build guide. Why am I even using a build guide if I don't even look at it? Let's just skip through the entire Lunar's Temple to fight Piety. For real this time though, she went down fairly easily because she wasn't swapping between her two dangerous forms. At this point, I was on my knees begging for the game to drop me a good bow. In the meantime, I crafted a bit to prepare myself not only for the end of Act 3, but more importantly, the Labyrinth. I grabbed most of the trials on the way and finished it off by getting the last trial in the Imperial Garden. The trials are like little mini games that you have to do during the story to unlock the Labyrinth. Just FYI. Now it was time to enter the Labyrinth. And I'm not talking about me trying to figure out public transport, <laughs> am I right? The Labyrinth is a dungeon that is randomized on the daily and has many traps. It is also the only way to get your ascendancy, which unlocks one of three options to specialize your character. In my case, I am a ranger and can specialize into a Deadeye, a Raider or a Pathfinder. All fancy names, but in short, each one does something quite well. What I needed was to become a Deadeye, which adds additional projectiles, Tailwind, which just makes me faster, and a few other things. But to get that, I needed to fight Izaro three times. And to not die once or else, I would get thrown out of the labyrinth and had to repeat everything again. Many people hate the lab because after many hours and many characters, it becomes really tedious to do it again and again. I get that, but in my opinion, I think it's an amazing piece of content in PoE, which makes the exile that you play grow in this grand story, but also you as the player have to grow or else you won't get through the lab and get a big boost in power. With Isaro defeated, I got my very first unique, Baited Breath. A decent unique belt that will give me some defense. Soon after, I also found Ikiaho's Promise. Fun fact, Ikiaho was one of the NPCs in the Trial of the Ancestors, a previous league or expansion back in August 2023. With all this, I ascended into the Deadeye that I always wanted to become. Dreams do come true. I'm sorry. Anyhow, I also used the Divine Font to transfigure a gem into Lancing Steel of Spraying. At that point, it was a popular gem and was worth a few Chaos Orbs. I could use those Chaos Orbs to buy upgrades in the future. Now, my biggest question was, how the heck do I sell this? I decided to use the Trade Chat in the game. Kill me. <laughs> this surprisingly didn't work. No one was answering me, just like all the women I messaged on Tinder. <laughs> I also couldn't find any info on the wiki or any old forum post that mentioned which trade chat is popular. I was in trade channel 44 and there are dozens or I think hundreds of different channels. So which one do I need to join for someone to buy something from me? But I also noticed that I had two whole Chaos Orbs. My thought was to use them to buy an upgrade from a player and while I'm already in their hideout, I just asked them if they wanted to buy my Transfigured Gem. If you have never played or traded a lot in Path of Exile, this probably seems insane to you. But I learned years ago, like 2015 or something, this game has most likely the best community ever. Players are extremely friendly in most cases and you can just chat them up. I was fairly confident that if I asked nicely and explained my situation that they would help me out. This actually worked later in the video, but not right now. I did trade the player and got a Karui Ward amulet for 1C, which was a nice upgrade. Having ascended into the Deadeye, it was time to finish Act 3 by moving up the Scepter of God and fight Dominus. Something I nearly forgot to mention here was that I found the Scion. For context, this is the only playable character or exile you can and need to find to unlock permanently. If you do this once, you can never see this animation. So it was kind of fun seeing this again after many years. Now onto the boss arena and Dominus. I quickly got rid of his goons 
Okay, the first death doesn't count. I mentally prepared for a semi-difficult fight against Dominus. But with Tailwind, I was moving around quickly, and with range attacks, I was able to constantly keep my distance. Die. The touch of God. Clearly, the damage wasn't high, but definitely fine for Act 3. Some of us live to regret our mistakes. Some of us don't. Try not to take it personally. With Act 3 done, I went through the aqueduct to Highgate, which was the Act 4 town. After arriving, I attempted to craft a new bow, and... <gasps> I fucking love this game. I went from around 600 DPS, so damage per second, to 1,500. Life is good now. <laughs> the bow looked amazing. Damage numbers went up, but I thought I could improve it a bit more. There is a crafting bench in Path of Exile, which lets you add a modifier to an item. The crafting bench can only be used in your hideout. Helena, which I saved back in Act 2, unlocks the hideout option. But the issue was, and <laughs> I had to giggle when I figured this out during the recording, I literally had no hideouts unlocked because of this brand new account. It was a very strange feeling after having played the game for so many hours. So if you ever think of brand new players not crafting their items and fixing their resistances, that's because they don't even have a hideout to use the crafting bench to do this. Of course, you can unlock this in the game, but what if you just miss it for two acts? Like myself. With this tension out of the way, I went to the Dread Thicket and unlocked my very first hideout. It had to be the Lush hideout. I crafted some resistances and life on my gear, and afterwards grabbed the Artillery Ballista skill gem, which I mentioned earlier. Finally, some good single target DPS. Back to Act 4, and progressing the story, I went into the Dried Lake and instantly felt the difference in damage. With Vol, Emperor of Purity down, I got the quest item, which lets me release a Death Shred Seal on the next area. Skipping past the mines, I went through the Crystal Veins into the Ressus Dream, and fought my way through effortlessly in terms of damage. Deaths weren't uncommon though because of low health and being an evasion build. I can evade many hits by getting better evasion gear or simply by running out of danger thanks to the haste aura. But in the end, if I get hit, it still hurts. Running through, I got to Daresso, who wasn't a big deal if I wasn't standing in his swirling swords. Then I moved on to Kaum's dream and fought Kaum, which seemed even easier. Artillery Ballista was the absolute gold. Or what do kids say nowadays? Do they just react with a 100 emoji? Anyhow, now with both Kaum and Daresso defeated, I brought the quest items back to Diala and she activated the machine that shot a massive laser. This opened an entrance into the belly of the beast. Okay, the story makes no sense if I explain it this way. This must seem like a fever dream to some of you. I don't even understand the full story with 6,500 hours. It's fine, we'll move on. Going through the belly of the beast, I found myself once again before piety. Holy heck, that damage. With her defeated and now on my side, I was able to move on to the Harvest and fight Malachi's goons. His goons are Doedre Darktongue, Chevron the Umbra, and Maligaro the Inquisitor. With Malachi's organs staining my inventory, I bring them to the Black Core, which opens the arena to Malachi himself. I admire this moment, Ranger. You and I, who create the most beautiful of nightmares together. Creation. Usually the concern of nature, isn't it? Not anymore. Now it's time. The first round was easy thanks to my bow. Now it was all piety. No. Ah! Rest in peace. Now, let us see if you truly understand what it means to be nightmare.
actually insane damage for a leak start. This was the moment I felt fairly confident that I could reach my goal in less than 24 hours of playtime. But there is still a long way to get there. Why are you so in love with death? Now, with Malakai down, I was allowed to move through the Ascent and enter Act 5. No. Having used the portal in the Ascent teleported the Ranger back to where she got exiled from, Oriath. Well, technically I landed in the slave pens in Oriath. Yikes. Blasting my way through and clearly not as weak as when I woke up on the beach in Act 1, I entered the Overseer's Tower, which is the Act 5 hub area. Going through the control blocks with insane lag, like, dear lord, just look at the screen, I finally got to, um, this guy. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. <laughs> Anyhow, I grabbed his balls, I mean his eyes, and went through Oriath's square, which was a nice cleanser after such a dark and moody area. Ignore the guards or monsters killing the citizens, doesn't matter. With the eyes of seal, I was able to enter the Templar courts, blast my way through until I reached the Chamber of Innocence. After putting my new bow to good use, I reached the arena and began the long fight against High Templar Avarius. Well, he was only one half of the fight. The other was Innocence. He pretty much used the High Templar as a mortal vessel. Innocence is, after all, a god. You can't see me right now, but I'm actually dabbing so hard right now because my sick bow and artillery ballista were more than enough for this fight. This god got got. With Innocence defeated, Sin, his brother, swooped down and saved him. In the meantime, something got woken up and the lowly exile has to defeat that thing. For this, I needed a certain sign. After entering the Templar courts, they looked a bit crispy. Now I want marshmallows. I fought my way through the lag in the Oshery to get the sign of purity. I also quickly did a side quest in the Reliquary to get an additional skill point. Running over the rooftops, I was heading towards the Act 5 boss, Kitava the Insatiable. He, or it, was a very static boss. Thus, my artillery ballistas had an easy time targeting and dealing incredible damage. I think all his attacks do a lot of damage and should definitely be dodged. No, I won't tank them to find out. With Kitava down... What? No! So, Kitava being a powerful god clearly was a bit too much for a lowly exile. Thankfully, Sin saved me, and with Lily Roth, I was able to escape Oriath back to Rayclast. This finishes Act 5, and thus the first part of Path of Exile's storyline. All this took around 3 hours and 30 minutes. Let's see how fast I was in the second half, which I will speed up a bit for the sake of the video. After traveling with Lily Roth on her boat and breathing in the ocean air, I arrived back on Rayclast and at Lionize Watch. This was the Act 1 town, but technically is now Act 6. Now, Lily Roth is a special NPC, not only because of her great voice lines. Time and tide wait for no man. Get your soggy ass aboard before we stick you with a fishing spear. Good tidings to you but because 
of her quest. If I cleaned up the Twilight Strand, which was the beach I woke up on, she would sell me most skill gems in the game. This is a huge help boosting my power, because now I could buy gems that I didn't have access to before. Technically, there is Siose in the library in Act 3, but I just ignore that part of the game. <laughs> Either way, with Lily's side quest done, I left the Act 6 town toward the coast and then into Mudflats. Right away, my health bar hurts. Enemies in these areas hurt a lot. Also, the server is apparently hurting. Somebody take it out of its misery. Holy mother of lag spike. After wandering through the Karui Fortress, I enter Tukohama's arena. It's not an easy boss, but I had the damage and if you just dodge, Okay, just dodge everything. That's the best advice I can give. Tukohama is one of the many gods that I now have to kill to progress the story. The second half of PoE's story is just a long-ass training arc to get back to Kitava. With Tukohama defeated, I use the Pantheon and get some additional physical damage reduction. This minor god and Pantheon passive helps balance my build that mostly focuses on evasion. Evading taxes, that is. <laughs> I then moved through the ridge of your mama into the lower prison, which ultimately ended by fighting Brutus and Chevron the Umbra. You might remember them back from Act 1 and Act 4 respectively. With both of them demolished, I run towards Abereth in Prisoner's Gate which is another god. All the gods that unlock a part of the Pantheon give an additional skill point, so kind of mandatory to do them. With a good bow and my ballistas, I made quick work of him. I also remembered the lore behind this god. He was a human guy who then turned into this thing, and to make all the goat men that you see in the game, he captured many women and did stuff to them. Let's just move on. It's too dark for this lighthearted video about an exile killing thousands of enemies and ultimately eldritch gods. Speaking of killing, I did a lot of that in the western forest and riverways, which were areas previously part of Act 2. As you may realize, things are being scrambled together in different ways, so you don't literally play through the same areas again. It also makes sense from a story point of view as some parts are being blocked off by NPCs that have become corrupted or just plain evil. After cleansing the land by killing another god called Rislatha, I went through more of the riverways, then through the southern forest and into the Cavern of Anger. You may remember this area because this was Merveil's arena, the Act 1 boss. Knowing my way through moist caverns from your mama last night, I arrived at the beacon. Quite a large area in which you have to stroll through the sand past the deadly tentacle monsters up to the beacon. By standing close to the fuel tanks, they slowly, very slowly, dear lord please move faster, they lock in and give fuel to the- oh my god there is another one! Jokes aside, this isn't too bad, but can be quite difficult if you don't have the damage or defense to handle the onslaught of enemies. I then threw the banner that I received back from Nessa into the flame. By the way, she turned into a mermaid. This feels like a fever dream again. Anyhow, banner in, flame go black, and here comes Mr. Whalem Roth. Lily's father. Having called him with the banner, he helped me out and brought me to the final Act 6 area, the Brine King's Reef. Before throwing myself at the Act 6 boss, I quickly teleported back to town, sorted out my inventory and crafted some resistances on my gear to get additional defense. With preparations done, I went to the Brine King. He was ultimately not that difficult. I noticed that a new stronger bow would definitely help me out here and instantly end the phases of the boss, but the few seconds don't matter in the grand scheme of things. With the first major god defeated, I use his soul power or something in my pantheon and move on to Act 7. Act 7 starts in the bridge encampment and following the road in the broken bridge area ultimately ends in the crossroads. Here the road forks in three ways. 
One is back to the forest encampment, the Act 2 town, which is currently blocked off. The other two are to the top and bottom. Because I'm not a top, I first followed the bottom road, go through the Fell Shrine ruins into the crypt. Blasting my way through with the Delirium Mirror active, which is the Grey Fog, I grabbed Maligaro's map. Teleporting back to the crossroads, going north, and through the Chamber of Sins, I use the map device. This opens portals into Maligaro's Sanctum. Um, is this his summer home? I mean, if he enjoys himself, I guess that's fine. I can see landlords from California trying to sell you this place. The spacious apartment is around 250 square feet, adorned with a kitchen and bathroom all in one. Right outside, you can find a swamp that helps with dry skin, and the neighbors, with their unique traditions and culture, shout and scream all day. That will be $3,000 a month, please. Back to the quest, defeating Maligaro's goons, and then himself, I grabbed the Black Venom, gave it to Silk, which in return gives me the Obsidian Key. That key allowed me to enter the back door to your mama, I mean, to the den, which was used as a side quest in Act 2. Now, the den was the main path to the Ashen Fields, and then into the arena against Groost. He was an NPC back in Act 2, but now he was helping a minor god called Ralakesh. Again, things were going very smoothly, thanks to the amazing build guide by Crouching Tuna. I quickly went from the Northern Forest to another minor god in the Dread Thicket. Big Mama Bear, also called Gruthkul. Being a literally big target makes it fairly easy with my ballistas. Also in the Dread Thicket are fireflies that I had to gather for Dina, an NPC in the Act 7 town. After going through the causeway and then the Val ruins, she stood before the Temple of Decay. After Yina turned into a fox, I'm not making this up, I swear. She burned the spider webs. This is quite a long area, but to keep things moving, I killed many spiders and other deadly creatures to finally enter Arakali's arena. She, yes, that is a she. I mean, look at those legs. Mm. She was the Act 7 boss, and that means she would be difficult. Or maybe not? Okay, um, this was way easier than I thought it's going to be. Maybe I can do this challenge in 12 hours. <laughs> I'm joking. With Arakali, another major god defeated, I entered Act 8. After entering the Sarn encampment once again, I swiftly did my second labyrinth, and with swiftly, I mean it, because the RNG gods shined upon me. I found a dark shrine with acceleration. We zooming now. We <laughs> Ballistas go brrr. Yoink my ascendancy skill points. With the lab done in just a few minutes, I was on to finishing Act 8, which starts by entering the Toxic Conduits. Mmm, <laughs> can you smell the moist green air? Lovely. Thankfully, at this point, damage was really solid, so I was just walking, shooting, and enemies were melting on my screen. Which is what I like. By killing Doedre, which you may remember from Act 4, I was able to move on in two directions. As with Act 3, it's about the Solaris and Lunaris temple. You can go either left or right, but ultimately it doesn't really matter, because you have to do both ways. I went towards the Solaris temple through the Quay and quickly did a side quest for Clarissa, which gives me another skill point. After the Quay, I entered the Grain Gate, blasted away some gemling dudes, and got a Thicket Bow. I slammed an Essence on it, and with some crafted attack speed, it was actually better. I should have looked for more upgrades now, but this is softcore, meaning death isn't that big of a deal, and I was also trying to go a bit faster. But if you are playing and dying a lot in Path of Exile, definitely take your time, look at the currency items and other stuff that you got, and see if you can craft something. Back to the Solaris Temple, I quickly blasted through that, grabbed the Sun Orb, and then chose the other way towards the Lunaris Temple. I will fast forward all of this until I found my first map, which was the Desert Spring map. Neat. 
also the moon orb. Now with both orbs in my inventory, I took some time to gear myself up. I equipped a good evasion chest with some chance to suppress spell damage. If I get lucky and enemy spells get suppressed, I take half damage, which is amazing. On top of that, it was also a four link. Rain of Arrows was now linked to... Wait, what am I doing? I equipped Lightning Arrow. To be honest, while writing this script, I forgot that I did that. The leveling guide said to equip the skill at level 69. Nice. That is roughly when you finish the story. I, on the other hand, usually equip the skill for the endgame way too early and then bitch around that it doesn't do enough damage. Yeah. No shit, Daniel. Thankfully, Lightning Arrow is based AF, and with a proper bow, it was very good. It also shot to the edge of the screen, which made clearing feel better. In addition, I still had my artillery ballista, which carried me into the Act 8 boss in the Harbor Bridge. It was also one of my favorite boss fights in the entire game. Not only do you fight one boss, but you fight two at the same time, which were the sisters Solaris, the Eternal Sun, and Lunaris, the Eternal Moon. The fight itself is just cool, because they swap places to attack you. The music and the lighting in the fight is also top notch. I cannot explain how excited I am for something like this in Path of Exile 2. I need it. No, seriously, this is off script now. Give it to me. <laughs> Having bested both sisters, which were two major gods, Sin absorbed their soul and added them to the Pantheon. The path towards Act 9 was now open. Fun side note when running through the Blood Aqueduct is what the content creator Subtract them said. I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of if your build doesn't feel good in Blood Aqueduct, something might be wrong. This is kind of true, because if your build takes even longer to come together, but you are already in Act 9, you might be playing the build way too early, or maybe your gear or setup isn't good enough yet. For example, the wrong support gems can really screw you over. Thankfully for me, as you see on screen, I was zooming through with a lightning arrow and thus returned to Highgate, the Act 9 town. Now the questline is a bit more complicated to get through this act, but I'll try to simplify it. In short, I had to get back to the belly of the beast, which you may remember from Act 4, where Diala shot a massive laser at it. That laser doesn't exist anymore, nor could I go the normal route because... Um, video games. So I had to go through the descent into the Vastiri Desert and quickly grabbed the Storm Blade, which I needed to get the Bottle Storm quest item. Okay, Fever Dream Alarm, I know. To make it that simple, I needed a quest item to get a quest item to get into the Oasis. That area had a minor god, and as mentioned earlier, every time I killed a minor god, I received a skill point. This minor god is called Shakari and is a scorpion boss, but also Sin's daughter. So for the greater good, even though Sin isn't the good guy either, I had to make her sleep forever. After that, and through the foothills into the boiling lake, I killed the boss to get the basilisk acid. At this point, I was already level 64 and could equip High Race Truth, which is an amazing unique amulet for bow characters. Trading with a player to get that unique amulet, I also asked if he wanted to buy my gem from Act 3. Sadly, he didn't. One day hopefully. I zoomed through the tunnel into the quarry and also got into the refinery to get the last quest item for Sin. He was now able to concoct something that burns a hole into the belly of the beast. Okay, this is kind of between us, but looking at the gameplay right now or the footage, it kind of looks like we're burning a hole into its butthole. 
Or is this his second butthole now? Anyways, let's move on. Before Saint burned the second butthole, I actually did the last minor god, Garukan, which was Sin's wife, or lover at least. It was now time to get into the belly of the beast's butthole, which sounds quite disgusting, and into the rotting core. It's not getting better. In the rotting core, I had to kill Chevron, Duedre, and Maligaro's soul thing once again. With all three defeated, I was now able to enter the Act 9 boss arena. What the fuck is that? <coughs> <coughs> Okay, I got it. Uh, the Act 9 boss was an amalgamation of all three bosses called the Depraved Trinity. Quite a cool fight and varies a lot in attacks because it's technically three bosses in one, but changed up a bit. The fight can be quite difficult as most attacks deal a lot of physical damage, but with a proper bow and my beloved ballistas, I made short work of it. What is the right pronoun here? The giant waves of blood flushed me out and straight into Lily's arms. Sorry, my fanfiction brain just took over. Act 9 was now behind me and I sailed into Act 10, which was the final and last act of Path of Exile's storyline. Time and tide wait for no man. Entering Act 10 town called the Oriath Docks may look similar because it's the last area of Act 5 before Lily takes the player back to Rayclast. While I killed some gods, they set up camp, but Bannon got kidnapped by some bad goons. Most notably, after saving Bannon, I went over the rooftops into the Ravaged Square and then through the control blocks to get rid of Vilenta, an NPC back from Act 5. She has gone mad and is a monster now. That's all I needed to know to kill her and get a skill point as a reward. Back through the Ravaged Square and into the Desecrated Chambers, I quickly melted the boss, which gave me the Staff of Purity. This quest item can then be brought to Bannon, who offers his life, and thus, Innocence was reborn. Sin and Innocence are brothers, as mentioned earlier, and thankfully they chatted it out or something, and Innocence will help me to get to Kitaba and aid me in the battle. Cool. With some resistances and big movement speed, I was ready to zoom even more, specifically through the Oshery for the last trial. Now I was able to tackle the third labyrinth. So I thought. It started off good, but ultimately I got tackled in the last fight with Izaro. I shouldn't have been surprised having only 2200 life. That's a bit low because you usually want to have 1000 life per labyrinth. Quite the bummer, but no big deal. There was something I was much more ashamed of. I on purpose skipped a minor god earlier in Act 8 but forgot to get it later on. Through the bathhouse, I went into the High Gardens, which is a dangerous area with porcupines. If they die, they shoot big spikes in your face. Doesn't sound appealing, does it? I got through unharmed and won against the actual last minor god, Yugol. With Yugol defeated and another skill point in the bag, I went back to Act 10, and with Innocence's help, I entered the canals. Some enemies in this area felt quite tanky, so maybe I should have crafted a new bow. I pushed on and into the feeding through, which was the last area right before Kitaba. I shall strike you down. Kitava was ultimately fine, not the fastest fight and I felt like I was falling behind the power curve, but for a brand new account, free to play by the way, I think I did okay. This took around 6 and a half hours, so definitely not a speedrun, but I was quite happy, mostly about having a build that just feels good already and I know how good it could become. With this, Kitava went down. And I now finished all 10 acts of Path of Exile, which means it was time to enter the endgame where the real fun begins. Oh my god.
okay, a bit too dramatic, but yes, there is a lot in the endgame, and this isn't even all of it. After having won against Kitava and arriving back in the Oriath docks, I chatted up Lily Roth. We went on a magical boat adventure, which you nor I can play sadly. But it is a boat, and we do like boats in this community. After the boat adventure, the exile gets woken up by Helena on the Karui Shores. The Karui Shores is the new hub area in the endgame. Why am I not spawning back on the docks, you may ask? Great question. Do you have an hour talking about the Elder, which is an eldritch being that came to the Atlas? Or maybe the war between it and the Shaper? What about the exiles that defeated the Elder in the story while Lily and myself were having a romantic boat date? The date is canon. Don't change my mind. And those exiles then became trapped in the Atlas by Zana which is also Shaper's daughter. Those exiles are also called the Conquerors or the Elder Slayers. Spoiler, one of them was pretty bad and destroyed Oriath, like completely. So that is why everyone had to escape from the docks. And then there was this floating lady. We could talk about all that, but I think you get the gist. Bad stuff happened while the exile was gone, and Karui Shores it is. The stuff that just came out of my mouth were the multiple endgame stories that happened over the past few real-life years in Path of Exile. Many updates later, the current endgame is called the Siege of the Atlas. Why is it a siege? Well, the people of Oriath have now seen and or heard about two eldritch beings that may or may not destroy Rayclast. They probably want to protect themselves. But if there are two eldritch beings, there is probably another one coming soon. Joke's on you, there are four. The four Eldritch bosses are separated into a group of two, one sub-boss and one main boss, focusing on the main bosses, which are called the Searing Exarch and the Eater of Worlds. Previously, I mentioned the Elder, and the Floating Lady is called the Maven. Those four Eldritch beings have to be defeated to get all four Void Stones for the Atlas, which is the goal of this challenge. How the fuck do I get there? Time to breathe a bit. I will have to explain more in a bit. Before that though, let me tell you what I was actually doing after finishing the story. I traded a few Chaos Orbs and got myself Bisco's Leash, a unique belt. It gives Rampage and overall makes me faster and do more damage as I kill more enemies. After that, I talked to Commander Kirek, who is in charge of the siege and is the main NPC for the endgame storyline. He gave me a map, which is a consumable item that you put into the map device and activate. You and I already saw something similar with Maligaro's map back in Act 7. The map opens portals to an area with a bunch of monsters, which I want to kill, because it's an ARPG, but also loot and potentially more maps. Now I have to briefly mention a few things about the Atlas. To progress the Atlas, one has to do higher and higher tiers of maps. Doing a tier 1 map, which I was doing right now, gave me a chance to get more tier 1 maps from enemies, but also a tier 2 map. If you get a tier 2 map, you blast through that to get a tier 3 map, and so on. On the way to tier 16, there's going to be some wacky stuff. I'll talk about it when it happens. Back to the challenge, I beat the map boss and got myself an Atlas passive point for the Atlas skill tree. Yes, another skill tree. It's Path of Exile, what did you expect? The Atlas skill tree is actually the major reason why I play this game so damn much. The Atlas skill tree allows the player to focus on whatever they want. Over the past years, there were many expansions and some of them were added to the core game. And now with this massive skill tree, no, the other one, this one, yes, the player can now focus on whatever they enjoy doing in the game. My first Atlas skill tree strategy revolved around getting lots of maps and Kirek missions. Kirek can offer a mission which technically is just a map. 
also shrines because they give temporary buffs which can make me go zoom zoom. Being a Deadeye and having Lightning Arrow, I was not only fast, but also had good damage to finish maps in 3-5 to five minutes. With each monster defeated, I had a chance to get my first Divine Orb, which is a very valuable currency item and I can use it to trade for better items. In short, the more map objectives I did, the more skill points I can use on the Atlas skill tree, which I can use to get even more maps and work my way up to tier 16s. After preparing my one and only hideout, I blasted maps and couldn't stop myself doing some League expansion content like Breach, Abyss and Ultimatum. Skipping ahead, I was close to the end of this 8 hour long session. I felt that I was slowly falling behind the curve in terms of damage against blue and rare mobs. Tier 4 maps are kind of tough when you haven't upgraded your bow in like many hours. To solve this issue, I didn't buy a bow, but I got myself a 6 link for only 4 chaos orbs. The prices for many basic items like this went down over the first few weeks during the new expansion. That was the reason why I wanted to play the current expansion and use the economy to my advantage. I also told the guy I traded with, hey, I'm a free to play player, please buy my gem, but I got the answer bait. <laughs> As I entered my first tier 6 map, I encountered the Envoy. Yes, another wacky name. He is the babysitter, I mean the right hand to the Maven. She has now found her way to the Atlas and it was my time to play with her. And with playing, it means she joins the map boss, adds temporary buffs to it and makes my life more difficult. Like a real baby, I mean eldritch thing. After beating the boss, I got the Maven's Beacon, which adds itself to my map device. Thanks, now I could call Maven to my maps whenever I feel like it. This is necessary to do to progress the endgame story. After a few more maps, I pushed into my first tier 8 map. Funny enough, that map also had the Nameless Seer. This is related to the current expansion Necropolis, but I had to check it out at least. He can sometimes offer very good uniques, but not this time, sadly. I also got the Luminous Astrolabe, which is an item for the map device, so I can call the influence of the Searing Exarch. This tier 8 map was also the third map boss Maven witnessed and thus gave me an invitation to her crucible or arena. What Maven does is she copies the map bosses so you can fight them later again in her arena. Maven is a more boss heavy experience in Path of Exile compared to killing hundreds of trash mobs in the map. A nice cleanser and also a different challenge that has to be overcome. With my gorgeous ballistas, this was no big deal. A quick breath before we go into the next big section of the video. All of this, which is quite a lot I think, happened in the first 8 hours and 30 minutes of my first session. I was now somewhat deep in the endgame and felt like I could actually do this challenge. Keep in mind, I'm just a mere mortal and not a speedrun god and weeb like Tai Tai. The second session started with me jumping straight in to your mom and blasting maps at level 80. You can lose a lot of time opening Path of Exile, then grabbing some water, maybe a coffee, browsing Twitter, I'm not calling it X, opening the third party programs, reading over the build guide, and so on. To minimize all of that, I did it before starting Path of Exile to beat the 24 hour challenge that I set for myself. No, this is not cheating, this is just being efficient. This session was around 4 hours and 30 minutes long and you may think not a lot can happen, but you are wrong! Actually, a lot happened, so let me briefly go over the highlights of my sleep deprived mapping session. I instantly skipped the boss in the park map because well, first off, I'm a noob, but also it was way too tanky. For this challenge, I had to go fast and wasting three minutes on fighting this boss that I can fight later again isn't really worth it. So I try not to do this again and again where I just sit around and fight the boss and realize 
this is taking way too long. I was now pushing tier 11 maps about 9 hours into this challenge, which really surprised me. I was definitely much faster than usual, because it usually took me around 8 to 10 hours to even finish the story. Quick question to you, the viewer, or chat if any streamer watches this, is this drop sound for the Exalted Orb a tink or a schwing sound? One thing that bothered me now was not having a map tab in my stash. I had to constantly look over my maps one after another and see which ones were missing the bonus objective. Quick reminder, if you do the bonus objective once, you get an Atlas passive point, which I wanted. Followed by that, I finally tried the third lab again. With more power, I finished it effortlessly. With two more projectiles added to all projectile-based skills, my lightning arrows filled most of the screen. That's how I like it. I was now actively ping-ponging between Maven and Searing Exarch to progress their quest lines. I had to do higher and higher tiers of maps for each to get to the end. Usually I just did it blindly, but for this challenge I actually had to use my noggin. After a few more maps I got the Flash Compass, Ew. which lets me call the influence of the Eater of Worlds. Now I can progress that quest line too, and finally work on getting those Void Stones. A highlight of this session was also finally getting a proper bow, more or less. It costed me 1 Exalt and 6 Chaos Orbs, and boosted my damage from 29,000 to 39,000 damage per second. So a decent jump in damage that I definitely felt when I was in combat. Keep in mind, if you are in combat in PoE, you usually gain a few buffs or certain interactions trigger things that will give you even more damage. So what you see is the raw unprotected damage. But being unprotected isn't good. This is where I would put the VPN ad. Preferably from a company that isn't in the US, which gives away all your data anyways. Wait, who said that? After putting my new bow to good use in a Maven invitation, I also traded some Chaos Orbs to get a Death Rush. It makes me go zoom. Okay, it also adds some defense, but no one cares about that. Glass cannon, baby! Also, the same player bought my Lancing Steel of Spraying Gem after I asked him for one Divine Orb. What an absolute giga chat. Can we get some claps in chat? I got that gem back in the first lab and finally made some currency with it. In the next map, I had a big map explosion, which I always like seeing, you know, it helps with my journey through the Atlas. But also in the same map, I got the sub-boss invitation for the Searing Exarch. After a bit more mapping and dying to Dominus, because my lightning resistance sucked, anyhow, I was ready to try the Black Star. I activated the invitation in the map device and portals opened to the Polaric Void. Maven, the challenge begins. The champion will fall. I usually delay these fights, but not this time. I really try to push myself doing the boss right now and trying to progress faster. It was a good decision because the boss wasn't too tough, even if I died once. Stop it. After going back to mapping, I quickly got my writhing invitation, which, as you may guess, is the sub-boss to the Eater of Worlds. But being a scared little bitch that I was, because he's a bit weird when you don't insta-kill him or insta-face him, I delayed the fight. Not for long though, because after buying a Searching Eye Jewel, I was already pushing Terrace, which was a tier 13 map. I was feeling quite good in my character and myself, so I just winked it and activated the invitation to fight the infinite hunger in the seething chime. This boss can be really annoying and could have one-shot me if I wasn't too careful. But he was a big boy and moved very slowly, which helped me a lot being a fast evasion-based build. So I just shot my arrows and used my ballistas. 
that's it. I barely defeated the boss in the first round. The new bow from earlier came in clutch. I then followed this up with a Maven invitation, which also was quite easy. Go get more! Yes, my queen. Blasting through the Cold River map, I got the Progeny of Lunaris. A very valuable divination card, which is worth around 450c, or 3 divines at that point in time. But this made me realize I had no premium stash tab. How the heck do I sell this now? I did find a way in the fourth session, but you'll have to wait to see it. I'm after all going chronological here. This isn't like the dumpster fire that is the story of last epoch. Sorry, I, I had to. Something else that was on fire, no, not my ass, uh, was myself, because I was doing my very first tier 16 map. Fuck! At the end of this session, I sorted out the tab that had all my maps. For people who don't know or forgot, you can sell three maps of the same name to most vendors and get a map of a higher tier back. This is very neat when you have many low tier maps, but want to run higher tier ones. After some simple flask crafting and using the Eldritch currency, I finally logged off and finished my second session. A lot shorter than my first one, but still incredible progress towards my first Void Stones. And much, much more. The third session was another six hours long and was incredibly eventful. I'm not trying to hype you up, like all the trailers that don't show gameplay at Summer Game Fest. I'm just speaking the truth. You'll have to watch to see it for yourself. Okay, I'm trying to hype you up a little bit. As a quick reminder, I still had no Void Stones. I was trying to get higher tiers of maps more frequently, and during this session I also started to struggle with my four basic stash tabs. And of course, I needed more damage, because it's an ARPG. I'm not a glass cannon, mom! To get my Path of Exile brain juices flowing, I started off by doing some lower tier maps, getting more Atlas passive points, but then quickly jumped into my fourth and last labyrinth. The last one is also called Uber Lab. It is significantly harder, that's what she said, and also more random than the previous ones. Thankfully, with PoeLab.com, which suggests the fastest way, it was fairly easy. Still, with 2.9k life, it is very easy to die, so being careful is a must. Or you just run really fast and pray. Just let Jesus take the wheel. With money on my mind, and with money I mean my last ascendancy points, I defeated Izaro. Again, for the fourth time. <laughs> I grabbed Focal Point as my last ascendancy note, and to make it that simple, it just helps me with dealing more damage against rare enemies and bosses. I now had more power than ever before, and did a Conqueror map, but I got quickly humbled by the map boss, so I just yeeted myself out of there real fast. It's not a skill issue, you know? No, please, listen. It's a damage issue, okay? To fix my skill issue, I mean my damage issue, I used the One Divine from the last session and got myself a proper spine bow with fire and lightning damage to attacks on top of some critical strike chance. The player who sold it to me was pretty based and even bought my Reign of Arrows of Saturation Gem. He bought it for 40c and even bought my old bow for 20c with an additional 80 Chaos Orbs as a donation. Seriously, I don't mention this enough in videos. Path of Exile's community is the best gaming community out there. I have never experienced this amount of friendliness, understanding and helpfulness in any other game with an active economy. Yes, there are always a few bad apples, but I don't think you can find a community like in PoE anywhere else. I do have to be honest though, I didn't earn those 80 Chaos Orbs that he donated to me, and using them would feel weird, but on the other hand, the person didn't know that I was a player with a lot of knowledge and experience. For him, I may have looked like a new player, so if you are a free-to-play player jumping into PoE right now, you may have a similar situation in which someone donates you a few Chaos Orbs or gives you an item for free. 
I think we can all agree on how cool that is. What isn't cool is the weather in Austria right now, but also what I had to do now with this spine bow. I had to swap to crit damage. I'm not a big fan of having a build and then drastically changing it to fit a new way to scale damage or defense. To explain what is a crit swap. In short, you take points away from your skill tree that are worth less and put them where they matter more. It's a lot of clicking around for a few minutes and looking at the guide if you're using one. In the end, you should be more powerful if you swapped at the right time. The guide creator probably knows best when to swap. I can't read though, so I just went with my gut feeling, which wasn't a bad idea, I think. I didn't swap all the way though. It was more of a 50-50 swap. It's not a skill issue, listen. Right, the Chaos Orb donation. I used it to get myself a proper Stitch and Vice belt with lots of life, fire res, and cold res. It also had a socket for an eye jewel. Just more power squeezed into the belt slot of my character. Now that the old belt was gone, which had the Rampage modifier, I had to get that back, which was incredibly easy and cheap. Shadows and Dust are unique gloves for one Chaos Orb, which has that modifier. It also has additional Mana Leech, so an even bigger plus. Having new gear on my hot gamer body, which I perfected over the past years. No, don't scroll up too high. Anyhow, with new gear, I threw myself at a tier 16 map, which was influenced by the Searing Exarch. In that map, I defeated the map boss, which was very tough, but I got myself the incandescent invitation. Holy heck a divine orb, finally! And in the same map, I got the screaming invitation, which you may have guessed is the quest item to fight the Eater of Worlds. But I wasn't fighting them yet, because I didn't feel ready. I didn't need to do them deathless, but I also didn't want to die five times and struggle too much. Speaking of struggling, my stash tabs. Oh boy, I was at the point where I would have really enjoyed a few more tabs or maybe just a better way of sorting things out. Here are a few things you can do yourself as a free to play player or even in general if you don't have a dozen stash tabs. First and probably the most important one is what I did earlier. If you remember, I sold three maps of the same name to get a map of a higher tier back. This works with many other items in a similar way, like with oils and essences. It also works with scarabs, but you don't get a better scarab back, you just get a random one. Second, splinters. I just don't pick them up. No, you can't force me. Third, items that aren't uniques might only be worth keeping if they have a high item level. Not always, but for most items. Next are gems with quality on them. Sell a bunch of them and if the quality adds up to 40%, you get one gem cutter prism back. After fixing my skill tree a bit more and squeezing more damage out of each point, I did another Maven Invitation. It felt fairly easy and that gave me the confidence to finally try the Eldritch bosses to get my first Void Stones. Starting off with the Eater of Worlds in the absence of symmetry and harmony. I think the damage was decent, sadly my movement wasn't. Maybe I should wait for the attack to appear and then move out of the way. Still, the Eater of Worlds went down and I slotted in the Grasping Voidstone into the Atlas. I will explain what this means in a bit. With this rush of adrenaline, why not keep going? So I attempted the Searing Exarch in the absence of patience and wisdom. Your absurd defiance ends here, Hatchling. Incineration. 
I find him more difficult because of his ball face, which did kill me. With him defeated, I got the Omniscient Void Stone. As a quick update, I have played for around 16 hours by now. I also got the unique jewel Forbidden Flame, which can be worth a lot, depending on its modifiers. This one may be worth up to 7 divines, which was very lucky to get. The problem is, how the heck do I sell this without a premium stash tab? Back to the Void Stones, which I mentioned a paragraph ago. What do they even do? The Atlas has maps on it, which have tiers. It starts at the bottom at tier 1 and goes up to tier 16. You probably remember that from earlier, but all I wanted is to play tier 16 maps because it has better and more loot compared to lower tier maps. The Void Stones allowed me to upgrade the tiers of all the maps on the Atlas. So tier 1 maps become tier 4 with a single Void Stone socketed in. A second one raises that tier even more until every map on the entire Atlas becomes tier 16. This doesn't change the maps you have in your inventory or stash, but it changes the maps that will drop in the future. So in short, I can now focus on running my favorite map at a higher tier or just focus on the few tier 16 maps at the top. After demolishing those Eldritch bosses and all this information dump, I think we both need a cleanser. So I jumped into the inscribed ultimatum that everyone got from the free Kyrex Vault Pass this league. I offered 10 Chaos Orbs, beat the challenge, and the offering got doubled. Easiest 10 Chaos Orbs of my life. I explained a lot, but what do I actually do now to get to the last two Void Stones? Both of them can be earned and worked towards, but I chose the direct option. I just bought the items from other players to go directly to the bosses. I could also pay players to invite me to those boss fights directly, but that seemed a bit cheap. I wanted to do the boss fights myself, but also trade for the items to see how difficult it may be as a free-to-play player. To do my strategy, I needed a lot of currency, which I wanted to get from running more maps. But these last two bosses are tough, so I better upgrade my gear too, which also costs currency. Now, if I would lose to any of the bosses, a lot of currency goes to waste, which I would have to farm again, which may not be possible in this 24 hour challenge. So I had to really make sure when to jump into those fights. While I was thinking of a solution of selling my jewel, a divine orb dropped. Sweet, that will get me towards my next body armor. I mapped a bit more and a another one dropped in the very next map. Wait, who's behind the wall? Oh my God, it's Chris Wilson. <laughs> After blasting lots of maps, I started to actually get some currency going. So I bought a few things. First off, a high res ire for three divines. A big body armor upgrade in terms of damage and defense. Followed by high res truth for 40c. It's the same amulet that I already had, but with a much higher crit roll. And now, surprise, I sold the Forbidden Flame Crimson Jewel for one divine. How did I do that, you may ask? I don't have a premium stash tab, but a player clearly messaged me for it. It's time to explain how people traded before the trade website was built and eons ago, before the API existed. The forums. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, it's not that bad, but pretty bad compared to just spending a few bucks and upgrading one of your stash tabs to a premium one. In short, you go to the forum 
click your way through and then set up a post in which you link your item, which also took a few minutes to figure out. With that one divine, I got myself some Chaos Orbs and traded it for a Maven's Writ. This item will allow me to attempt my third Eldritch boss. But something that I forgot was, I needed to finish Maven's questline to even fight her. Awkward moment. While I did that, I found an Einhar memory that was worth 100 Chaos Orbs. Selling that is way more straightforward because the trade website supports it. I just say I want to sell this item and then say I want Chaos Orbs for it. A few people actually offered that type of trade, so I can message them directly. The final upgrade before the fight was a new quiver, but my skill issue was leaking out of my ear holes. And I looked at the Val lightning arrow damage in the character screen. I was looking at the wrong skill. So I have no idea if I even gained or lost damage. But it felt fine, so I just didn't notice. With room temperature IQ, I now attempted the Maven in the absence of mercy and empathy. I couldn't dodge everything and each hit hurt a lot. Her attacks also dealt cold damage, which gave me the chill debuff and slowed me down. But overall, it was an incredible fight. I truly didn't expect to do so well, but in the last phase, well, one death is a must. After that short setback, Maven was defeated. She doesn't die, because her caretaker, the envoy, comes to her rescue. For people who don't know the lore, she's actually a baby. Eldritch thing. That's the reason why the envoy protects her. He's pretty much the babysitter. With the ceremonial void stone socketed in, I now had three out of four void stones at level 92, 19 hours and 40 minutes into this challenge. There wasn't much time left to get the last void stone from the elder, or technically the uber elder. Can I power myself up in time, or will I have to get into the fight with subpar gear and lose my one and only chance? This was it, the last few hours before the end of the challenge. I needed currency to buy the fragments to the Uber Elder and then actually beat him first try. So I changed up my Atlas skill tree to use every Atlas passive point that I gathered so far and focused on things that give me currency right now or things I can easily sell like scarabs to other players. Now the not so fun part, sorting out my stash tab. God damn it. I sold alteration orbs to a player to get chaos orbs. This is again possible thanks to the bulk trading option on the official trade website. I want chaos orbs, please thank you. <laughs> Being a curious little rat enjoyer, I timed myself how long it takes to finish a map. The faster I finish a map, the more monsters I probably kill over that period of time. And every mob is a gotcha moment. Took me around a minute on the low end up to 4 minutes on the high end. Pretty darn fast for me. 
with some cash flowing in, I started trading for the Uber Elder Fragments. Quick side note, I mentioned a war at the very start. So that war was for the Atlas and it was between the Shaper and the Elder. Those two fights still exist in the game and the Uber Elder fight is the final conclusion to that war. With that lore dump out of the way, these fights vary a lot in length. The Elder fight is quite short and is a lot of sitting around, if you have the damage. It might take you a few minutes. That's why the two fragments that you get from the Elder fight cost 50 to 60 C each. You only get one or the other fragment after a single fight though. The Shaper fight is much longer. I think it's a minimum of 5 minutes depending on your movement speed. At a certain health threshold, Shaper teleports the player away. Now the player has to find a way back, rinse and repeat until he is defeated. The fragments from Shaper cost around 100 C each, which makes sense. It takes player much longer to do something, so they obviously want to be rewarded. In the meantime, I wanted to test my build and power level, which is of course over 9000, and see if I can easily beat the Phoenix boss. He is a guardian to the Shaper fight, but TMI, too much information, I get it. Either way, I felt kind of strong against him, but this is Path of Exile, so there is always more power to be had. Specifically, the Pantheon. I spend a few Chaos Orbs to get Divine Vessels so I can trap the souls of some bosses and upgrade my Pantheon further. It's not an insane amount of power, but still every little bit will help me in the final fight and doing this takes me maybe a few minutes. Having been quite lucky with all the drops and running lots of maps very quickly, I finally bought the last Shaper Fragment and could attempt the fight to get the last Void Stone. But if I failed, I would have to farm many more Chaos Orbs or Divine Orbs, which I may not be able to do. So I decided to delay this until the very end. I swear I'm not doing this for the video. <laughs> Keep in mind a few more divine orbs and I could get a new bow which can give me a big boost in damage. With this I ran even more maps and actually made quite a lot of currency by focusing on my atlas skill tree strategy. It involves clicking a lot of currency though. Thankfully, it was only for a short time because I was quickly sorting out my stash tab and traded the four fortunate div cards for 84 chaos orbs. I also finally sold the divination card, the progeny of Lunaris for three divines, which I got in the second session. With all this cash, I spent five divines on a lethal pride unique jewel. How the heck do I explain this jewel to non-PUE players that may watch this video? In short, okay, here we go. Lethal Pride is one out of five unique jewels that you can get from the Legion content. I'm not going to explain exactly where and why, let's just move on. There are many unique jewels, but I wanted the Lethal Pride one. The jewel has to be socketed into the skill tree and changes the nodes around it. Some jewels change it a lot more, some change it less. That randomness comes from the roll on the item. This number right here. A single digit difference can change everything. So you want a specific jewel with a specific number on it and some other stuff. I thankfully found one on the trade website for 5 divines which gave me double damage and some life. I feel like this confused everyone. I'm sorry. In short, more power me likey. Another source of power that is probably easier to understand were my flasks. Thus I put on the big boy pants and asked my mom for a loan and bought a jade flask, a silver flask and later on a quicksilver flask. Something else that I didn't had before was the hideout from the atoll map. Some of you may not know, but you can find hideouts during the story, like I did with the lush hideout but there are many other hideouts that you randomly find from maps. Some might take you 5000 runs though. I think this one is easy to find, but kind of funny that I found it in my 24 hour challenge. Why was I wasting time and decorating my hideout now? What was I smoking? To be honest, I thought I was hot shit at this point. 
I was fast, dealing lots of damage, and maybe getting one shot once in a while. Doesn't matter. To test myself, why not try the most dangerous Elder Slayer of them all? Cirrus, Awakener of Worlds. Cirrus, please, we want to help you. Don't do anything hasty. Destroying you is as easy as flicking a pest. No! Son of! Kirak! How boring and small. You want the Atlas? Take it! It's yours. But Aureth? Aureth, I will burn to the ground! Perhaps the suffering of my fellow citizens will finally stir something. I actually had no major issue against Cirrus at this point. Sure, I got hit a few times and had to recover, but the fight itself is very readable. I kept moving around and tried to keep him in my vision all the time. Not seeing him is probably the worst thing you can do. I also need to mention how absolutely amazing his theme is. In general, Path of Exile's OST is top tier, and I'm really glad I briefly talked to Camille at ExileCon. I defeated Cirrus, and at that point I knew I was onto something. To me, he is a bit easier than the Uber Elder fight. If I can do Cirrus Deathless, I should be able to defeat Uber Elder right now. With some time left and having gotten an Awakener Orb, I had a few Chaos Orbs to spend. Starting off with a new Quiver for one Divine Orb. I also grabbed an Exalted Orb and slammed it on my Stitch and Vice Belt and got increased Flask Effect. With a few minutes remaining on the clock, I prepared myself. Mostly mentally. Oh no. Lag spikes. Putrefy, rot, spoil, and fester. Exile, do something! If I lost focus for a few seconds, it may cause my death. I was weaving through Elder's attacks and dodging Shaper's beam over and over. The lag spikes also added a really nice level of tension. That's the nicest way of saying it. But one death was inevitable. And one more, because why not? The Uber Elder was now defeated, dropping the Decayed Void Stone. Thus, I now had all four Void Stones and completed the 24-hour challenge on a free-to-play account at 23 hours, 55 minutes and 36 seconds in-game time. I, I cannot believe I'm here, but uh, we have made it. Congratulations. <laughs> now that you have watched my entire journey, thank you for that, by the way, you might have a few questions. I'm gonna read this off of my phone like a real professional, by the way. So, was it fun to be a free-to-play player? I think to a degree, yes. 
it definitely limits you in a lot of things that you're just used to over the years of playing Path of Exile with a bunch of stash tabs. But it didn't really push me along to be better. I think what pushed me along to be better was the time limit. The 24 hours really forced me to just do things that were most efficient. Even though you saw it in some clips, and maybe I'm showing it right now, I did a few blighted maps here and there, and obviously Cirrus, the Awaken of Worlds, wasn't necessary. But it was kind of fun, you know, just trying out, can my build, which is like 19 hours old or something, can it actually do this challenge? And yeah, surprisingly, it could. What were the major challenges that I had to overcome? With 6,000 hours, I have seen a lot. Like, I have seen a lot of the video game, especially when it comes to the end game. Uh, not specifically maybe Delve and all the other content, like in-depth, but yeah, running maps and blasting and killing a few bosses. Like, I can do that. I, I know my stuff around that. The only thing that I had to learn was not to sit on currency. So if I had three divines, I should use them. Bigger question, what would I want to see changed and improved for free-to-play players? I think an easier way to trade unique items is probably the most obvious one. Imagine player A with a premium stash tab says, I would buy this unique item for three divines. A free-to-play player should be able to find player A in some way through the trade website. I think this indirectly already works because I was able to find people that ask to buy items off of me through the trade website. The problem is you're being undersold 99% of the time. I definitely sold many things way below the average price on the market. And now you have the problem is it pay to win because someone who sells the same item through a premium stash tab has more currency than the one who doesn't? That's just not good. Just, yeah, that's just not cool. Next question is, would I recommend this challenge to someone else? Definitely to all content creators, because, you know, it broadens your horizon. You will realize how difficult it may be for some of your viewers that are free-to-play players to do certain strategies. Free-to-play players don't have three quad tabs full of maps and scarabs they can prepare on one day and then run it all the next day. During this challenge, I had an average of three to five maps prepared in my inventory, and then I had to prepare a few more. I didn't have a map tab to have hundreds of maps ready to run. It's also super annoying having to go over every map bit by bit to find out which one doesn't have the map objective or the bonus objective. That is awful. That is truly awful. That there is isn't a better system yet it's, it's kind of sad and if you do this challenge as a content creator uh, you will also quickly realize how much loot is in this game and how impossible it is over a long period of time to actually fit all of it into your four basic stash tabs if i would go for another 24 hours with that account now i may reach the absolute limit of my stash if i would pick up everything and i didn't because at some point i just had a much stronger filter and only picked up like the most obvious stuff but still four basic stash tabs in the current economy for a true free-to-play player is i can only imagine how horrible that experience is over like multiple weeks and lastly, for you as the viewer who maybe hasn't even played Path of Exile, uh, don't do this challenge. <laughs> no, don't do it. Seriously, take your time with the game. It's, it's not a sprint, uh, but a marathon. Build guides can help you a lot, and I highly recommend them, because the game is very punishing. But it's also extremely large, as you can see from this video, even though I cut out a lot of stuff. At the end of the day, this was just a fun challenge to test the limits of what I can do. Same as some Elden Ring challenges in which you finish the game by rolling into the bosses for hours. I mean, who would be so insane to do that? Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, subscribe for more videos like this, which hopefully don't take me two months to make. <laughs> and don't forget to stay hydrated, gamers.